Moon. Good afternoon. The Full House. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Pamela Horn, Director of Cross-Platform Publishing and Strategic Partnerships at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our hosted event for the MAC, Museum Access Consortium. Hopefully it's the first of many. Cooper Hewitt is committed to broadening its audiences and ensuring the museum is welcoming to all. We're thrilled to be able to use the galleries, museum resources, to raise awareness of accessible design innovation, inspire dialogue, and leverage Cooper Hewitt's role as a dynamic design hub to promote problem solving in support of inclusivity. Thanks to our partners AARP and the Ford Foundation, we are in our second week of Cooper Hewitt Lab Design Access, which is a free programming series taking place uh, first two weeks of February on, in these galleries that usually uh, house exhibitions. Uh, we're uh, activating the space uh, with learning and experimentation, uh, interactive activities, workshops, discuss discussions, and more for visitors of all ages uh, to engage. We are presenting it in partnership with the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, um, and some of our other collaborators include San Francisco-based Creative Growth Art Center, Columbia University Digital Storytelling Lab, which is coming up on Thursday. We'll, we're hosting a salon for verbal description. Uh, we had a Google hackathon, and we have our third in our series of three dance classes with Dance for PD with Mark Morris. Uh, and a Real Abilities Film Festival screening of Imagine tomorrow night. So if you would like to join in any of the other activities, please uh, go to our website and see what the schedule is like. Um, I do welcome you to take a look at the projects that are on our walls here. These were uh, design access projects that were, uh, these were the answer to a call for design access solutions from university design students across the country. Uh, they're fantastic and we had them here to present on Friday. Um, so uh, one other note is we have family, a week long of family events uh, that are designed around access uh, coming up on the week of the 19th to the 24th in these galleries. Uh, in the spirit of our accessibility commitment and this being an ongoing movement, we encourage you to submit your ideas for objects that you've found particularly um, inspiring or have used uh, that could make the world more accessible. Please send them to designaccess at si.edu. We welcome your submissions. Uh, and now, I'd like to throw it over to Barbara, the, panel, the moderator for your panel this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I will second the welcome and second the suggestion that you do take the time and look at the poster on the wall in this gallery. Um, some of the design solutions are truly imaginative and wonderful, and I'm hoping that the prototype will be in production soon. I hope you enjoyed the tour, and we welcome you upstairs to the second part of this collaboration of New York's Museum Access Consortium and the Cooper Hewitt America's Design Museum. The Museum Access Consortium, uh, better known as MAC, is dedicated to promoting and facilitating access to cultural institutions, museums, performance spaces, and experiences for all audience. 
We are a volunteer organization that develops professional trainings and workshops on best practices in the field. Um, we welcome you to join our mailing list and we welcome you, if you are interested in participating, to get in touch with Mac um, and join us as volunteers. This afternoon's discussion will focus on universal design and best practices in designing and developing exhibitions. It was inspired originally. It was inspired. Yes, it was inspired originally by the um, 25th anniversary of the Amer Americans with Disability Act issue of Exhibitionist, the Journal of Name, which is the American Association of Museums professional network for exhibition designers and developers. Uh, you can read this free online if you go to the AAM website and go to Name. The articles dealt with bringing greater accessibility to museums and exhibitions across the country during the planning, development, design, education, interpretation, and evaluation stages. Except for mine, which was a historical essay on the AAM and how it promoted and facilitated the acceptance of ADA compliance in the museum field. Today we will be hearing from exhibition developers, spatial and interactive designers, and museum educators all have collaborated, although not necessarily with each other, on multiple projects that took on the challenge of universal design and accessibility. Each will speak briefly about his or her training in museum work and how and when universal design became part of the projects. Um, we will then have a panel discussion and open up to questions from the audience. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you could see the principles of universal design. So the first is equitable use. Design is useful and marketable to people with diverse abilities. Design accommodates a wide range of individual preferences and abilities. It's easy to understand regardless of the user's experience, knowledge, language skills, or current concentration level. Design communicates necessary information effectively to the user, regardless of ambient conditions or the user's sensory abilities. And it minimizes hazards and the adverse consequences of accidental or unintended actions. Used eff effectively and comfortably with a minimum of fatigue. And provides appropriate size and space for approach, reach, manipulation, and use, regardless of the user's body size poster or mobility, posture or mobility. <laughs> so please keep those in mind as we listen to um, each of the speakers at first introducing him or herself, talking about what kind of training they had in design, education, um, or their other original field and when or whether universal design became a part of that training. So uh, let's start alphabetically. I, it doesn't work. Let's start anti-alphabetically with Paul Orselli of POW. <laughs> yes. Hello. Um, I suspect for many reasons I'll be an outlier on this panel, but uh, I'm sure you'll bear with me. Um, here, I'll stand up. Um, my background is not in design. My undergraduate degree is in anthropology and zoology, and my master's degree is in science education. Um, 
However, I have to say, relevant to this conversation, Barbara asked when we became aware of universal design or accessibility uh, in our work. And I have to say that, like many things in life, uh, it, it doesn't really have an impact on you until um, it relates to somebody that you know personally, often, or someone in your family. In this case, it was my mother, who at the end of her life used a wheelchair. And I remember her coming to visit a museum that I worked at, and instead of being able to come through the front door, they sent her around to the back, to the loading dock. So imagine how you would feel if one of your parents or somebody in your family who uh, had a disability, instead of coming to visit your museum, coming through the front door, was shuttled through the loading dock. Honestly, that, that was my introduction towards the notion of access and universal design. It didn't make me feel good. <laughs> it didn't make her feel good either. But um, I think from experiences like that, uh, I know that as I've continued to design and develop and work on exhibit teams for now, 35 years later, um, I think about situations like that and how I don't want people who come to museums to feel like second-class citizens or to feel small when they just want to have a good time at a museum. Um, I think that's my opening remark. Me? Okay. My name is, is this working? Yeah. My name is Steve Landau and I'm the founder of Touch Graphics, which is a company that got started uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I also, I'm a bit of an outlier, probably, although I guess if we're all outliers, then, then um, <laughs> I don't know. But uh, m my, and it's also funny because, you know, in retrospect, it's, we all sort of can create a kind of story for our, our, ourselves um, that, that makes sense only in retrospect. And I, so I'm going to pull out of my past the following events that now I can point to and say that it all makes sense. But I remember when I was a, a little kid, my grandmother had a stroke and she um, was completely um, incapacitated and came to live with us. And she could only say one word, which was, which was yes. And she would, I don't know why that is, but I guess it's something that happens um, with that particular um, um, kind of brain uh, injury. But it was my job to teach her how to speak again, somehow. And uh, I really was very absorbed in that process, although I think much, she, she really didn't care and uh, was sort of humoring me, I guess, in thinking back about it. But then many, many years later, when I uh, was, had to, to do the thing that everyone has to do, which is decide what they want to be when they grow up, I didn't really know, uh, so I selected architecture uh, and because it seemed like something that would be fun and that I probably could do and that it reminded me of the things that I liked to do as a child, which was you know making gadgets and things. And um, <clears throat> so then I did go to architecture school and pursued that professionally for 10 years and then I had a kind of a... Um, uh, a lucky event, and maybe that's, you know, uh, something that we all should be paying attention to when those when those things happen. But I got a phone call out of the out of nowhere from a lady named Karen Gorgi. I don't know if anybody here knows who she is. You do. Karen is the, she runs a thing called the Computer Center for Visually Impaired People at Baruch College, which is part of CUNY, and she was um, involved with the very early uh, uh, process of figuring out how to make tactile maps using computers. And so she called me through some series of personal connections and asked me to, to come and speak to her. And I had never 
uh, met a blind person before. Uh, I knew nothing about that field and uh, decided to go just because I was curious and we really had a kind of a, a connection and I ended up going to work for her and quitting my, career, my profession, which was extremely uh, difficult to do when you don't really have any training uh, in something. Uh, so I ended up um, starting the company with her as a kind of collaborator. We got a bunch of grants from the uh, education department and started making devices. And then I realized that this is kind of what I was always meant to do and then I just had taken a circuitous route. So that was 20 years ago and since then we've been making a lot of things, not just for museums. Museums is one of our areas of focus, but our main thing is how to use the, t the sense of touch to deliver information uh, in a universal format. So I first became aware of universal design in a way after I had already started working on tactile design. Because really, if you, you know, there's a, real, there's a difference between assistive technology and universal design. I don't know if that's a topic that is of interest, but assistive technology is really solving problems for a specific user categories. So for example, people who are blind need to learn Braille. We were developing products that would, you know, would automatically administer Braille uh, lessons uh, without the need of a human instructor. So that is really not universal design. However, what I started to realize was that products that are just tactile are really hard to market. You really have to add a lot of visual information. You have to add text. I'm holding up now one of our more recent projects, which was a book we made for the Cabrillo um, National Monument in San Diego. And you can see that it's very visual. And uh, we realized that, you know, when the visually impaired person came to this place, they needed to have, uh, they need to be with their friends and family, and to just give someone a book that no one else could see and understand was really inadequate and really was very um, counterproductive if, if our goal is to create inclusivity. So we started doing visuals on everything, and then we started adding audio, because audio is also adds another level of interact, of, of uh, information that's accessible. So for me, universal came about through this kind of backwards process, starting with just thinking about what people with vision impairments need, but then backing away from that and starting to think about what products could benefit from tactile information and audio and visual and large print and description. All those things layered together, to me, is what universal design is really for and can do. I'll go ahead and start. Uh, so my name is Edita Lewicka. Uh, I'm a designer at Potion. Uh, and Potion is a, a small studio. We are very at the of Manhattan. Uh, and we focus on transforming experiences through design and technology. Um, and is it on? Yes. You. Is this one working? Yes. Great. Uh, so um, it's interesting because um, a lot of our projects, all of our projects, are basically individual experiences that we have with each institution, from museums to artists to um, to particular companies, etc. So like they are very individual based, and it's very high a collaboration process. Uh, as for my background, um, I studied uh, design at FIT. Uh, I'm a trained graphic designer, and when I came to Potion, uh, I started doing interaction design, and then from there, I, uh, 
as we worked more and more with museums, the problem of accessibility uh, and ADA standards came into life for me. That's kind of when I started learning about universal design, how I'm continuing to learn in universal design. Basically, it's kind of a never-ending lesson here. Uh, but I remember I have this like vivid memory in my mind when I was small and I was still in Poland, I was like so fascinated with Braille and like always like everywhere in museum, I would just touch it and like just feel it. Uh, but I would not, I would never learn it of course, but it was like such an interesting tactile experience for me, even though I'm perfectly vi visually, you know, not, uh, uh, how do I say it, impaired. So, uh, but it was still like such something I always seeked out even from a small age, so that kind of like coming back right now, it's interesting. Yeah, thank you. All right, last but not least, I'm Sarah Litfin. Um, very good, <laughs> very good. Um, and I, uh, where am I is always a question. I, well, to start, the story, I was a week ago downstairs in the exhibit, and I just want to tell a real quick story to call out how wonderful this exhibit is, because there was a woman on the tour, it was uh, led by Eileen, um, one of the docents here. Is she here? No. Um, and uh, there was a woman who, as we went through, there was a, the app that shows um, wheelchair accessible dining locations that's crowdsourced. And, and she said, oh my God, my mom is a walker user, I gotta get this, and you know, used her pen to grab it. We went a little further and there was the radio that you just lift up to hear. And she said, my dad has dementia, this is, this is unbelievable, are they making these, can I get one? And then at the very end of the tour she said, you know, and this is, hang on, I've got the direct quote because I wrote it down. She said, I wanted to see this exhibit, but I didn't know I'd have a personal connection. And to me, I was like, congratulations, <laughs> right? I mean, not to her, to the designers of this exhibit, because I think that's really the point. Um, so in any case, thanks for, thanks for all of that, and congrats. Um, my story is 10 years ago, I, I got a job at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum um, in the education department, and I was lucky enough to be at an institution that had already invested in making accessibility a cultural priority. Um, and so I had access training when I first started working there. And in fact, my supervisor um, and her, the person who had been her supervisor before she left were former co-chairs of the Museum Access Consortium and some of the early members. So I really had my, learn my training on the job. Um, and soon thereafter, um, her name was Danielle Linzer and Cindy Vandenbosch, I want to call them out because they've been such mentors and continue to be leaders um, in the city and in the field. But soon after Danielle left, I took over the sort of responsibility for accessibility um, as the point person in the museum. And just because of the way that staffing worked at that particular time, I found myself not only the staff person responsible for doing accessibility training um, among all staff, but also on the project teams for two major uh, changes, a move to a new visitor center and the opening of the very first wheelchair accessible permanent tour. So um, I actually got to collaborate with both Steve and some of Edita's colleagues on, on the project of Shop Life. Since then, I've, I've gone on to go to graduate school. I'm currently a doctoral candidate in history, um, but I've sort of pursued my museum work and exhibit design since then. And so part of why I was so excited to be a part of this conversation is to share some of what I've learned about the differences between different processes at different organizations as I've been involved with this. Um, and sort of the experiences that I've had being in an in a exhibit that is about or intentionally the very first wheelchair accessible tour. How do we do that when it's very foregrounded as a priority for it to be universal designed? And a lot of those, those exhibits get a great amount of attention. But then there are also every other tour, every temporary exhibit that goes on in every single exhibit all over the country. And those we don't talk about as much. Um, and I, have, I, I wanna um, share and talk and think and, and hopefully um, continue this conversation about those experiences and how we might continue to build universal design into them.
Great, thank you. Um, people are shaking their heads. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. So um, I guess we are all outliers in some way. I came through theater design and a lifetime commitment to civil rights and social inclusion. And my first access work um, was related to AIDS because in the um, early years of AIDS and into the early years of the uh, medications, the disease mimicked many forms of other diseases and had many um, symptoms that would now be considered access related. So um, there, there was a virus that could damage vision very quickly. Um, there was a, another virus which could impair touch. And so those sort of almost instant disabilities um, got my attention. And so I, I started to become more and more involved with access and accessibility. Um, in that period, I also had the great fortune to be able to switch my careers um, into museum work, which is, what, of course, what I had always wanted to do. And so I brought the access focus with me as much as possible and um, then discovered Mac and have been very involved with Mac as well as the um, Diversity Coalition since then. The universal design codification, which is what I showed you before, um, I find to be very helpful as a way of, of helping people to think of the responsibility of the institution to every possible individual who might want to participate in something that that institution is presenting. Um, many designers now, architects as well as interactive, who are in graduate school will be trained with those principles. Um, others of us who are older or were trained earlier um, just find them useful as a way of communicating um, the institution's responsibility. And um, so that's how I get into it. And as, as you, you know, actually a, a panel full of outliers can be a very good thing. <laughs> um, so I wanted to uh, expand the conversation, now that you've heard how we started, um, to what the commitment to access and universal design means on a day-to-day -day basis in museum work. So I'll start with Paul, and I should have, ex I should have given his title when I introduced him because it's one of the great titles in the museum world. He is the chief instigator. <laughs> I, I might live up to that with my next statement. I hope so. Um. It, it seems to me that m museums miraculously find money for things they want to spend money on, and just as miraculously can't find money for things they don't want to spend money on. <laughs> and, and that's my experience with working with museums and universal design and accessibility in a nutshell. We talk a good game, but talk, as you might have heard, is cheap. W what are you actually doing about those things. And so, um, I, 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 I sort of can't comprehend the number of times I've heard a museum director say something along the lines of, well, we don't get that many blind or vision impaired visitors, so why do we have to do that? Or, you know, just change out the terminology. Um, 
So I'm, I'm, um, <laughs> I'm incredibly intolerant. I mean, I, I'm, 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 in some ways I'm a good creative partner, but in some ways I'm a massive pain in the you-know-what. Um, because I think that um, museums, when it serves their purposes, uh, like I said, talk an incredibly good game. If they're talking to a funder, of course, we, we are everything and sliced bread and a cherry on top. But when it comes to actually uh, providing that access, we often fall short. And it's not just about money, and it's just not about staff. It's just the wherewithal to do that. Um, that's easy for me to say up here um, on a panel like this, but I, I, I think one reason that I'm still in the museum business is that I have uh, very high expectations for the museum business, and I don't really want to accept these sort of mealy-mouthed excuses. So um, we, can, we, can, we can talk about how, how to practically uh, uh, turn that uh, sort of righteous anger into action, which I'm, I'm happy to talk about a little bit, but uh, my, my basic premise is, is still the same. Museums always find the money for things they want to spend money on, and they miraculously don't have the money for things they don't really want to spend money on. Wow, that was... Um, I'm a little bit less um, downbeat, I guess, or, or... Actually, I'm seeing the museum world changing now for the better, and I think that while Paul's observations are obviously accurate and the product of a lot of knowledge of the way things really are, at the same time, well, I, I, had, I had been noticing a real uptick in the number of museums that contact us to ask us about doing new projects, which I it's the only real metric that I have for evaluating, you know, the state of the state of affairs. But just, you know, and obviously there's a lot of alternative explanations for our um, improved business outlook at the at the moment. Um, but I guess part of it is to do with uh, the growing understanding in the museum community that the state of the status quo is really not supportable and as the population ages and as disability becomes more prevalent as a normal outcome of being old, uh, museums are starting to realize that it's not just a question of when they get around to it or um, if they're compelled by the government to comply with access standards, um, they're starting to realize, I think, that it's good business and um, that it's also not impossible to do. So, you know, I guess the change in the government in the last year has sort of put some of those um, projections into question because the Justice Department, which was the, which used to be the main motivator of museums around the United States to improve their accessibility, I believe uh, we can't rely on that um, as a continuing force, although I have no real evidence for that, but um, just seeing what's happening in the government um, leads me to think that that would no longer be a priority. Um, at the same time, there seems to be enough momentum in, in the field that more museums are reaching out to uh, people who have proven um, solutions that can help them overcome this 
really, um, you know, kind of shameful um, failure uh, to ensure that these public uh, resources are equally available to everybody. And if that requires, um, you know, a, a change in the marketplace to, to compel organizations to invest in these um, initiatives, then that's okay, uh, as long as it happens. You know, my, as again, my, my, my personal uh, experience is that it is continuing uh, to grow. And just, just seeing the number of people here today that are interested in this topic, it's very encouraging. So I'm a little bit less, um, I'm a little bit more uh, optimistic. From, uh, I come from a little bit different angle because our our work at Potion focuses more on uh, digital stuff. So uh, interactives, touch-based, projection-based, um, app-based on uh, on like different devices, basically. Uh, so what I've been noticing is that uh, over the years the uh, systems uh, are becoming more accessible. So, for example, the uh, the iOS devices have accessibility uh, in them, and uh, a lot of uh, apps that we do are built especially for these. So that, um, but just being prepared basically to accommodate for them. So like have it, making sure that all text is live text to be read by the device, to be accessible in those ways. Uh, but like what we are still like struggling with is basic uh, is definitely the large interactives, the large like room scale um, touch surfaces, touch tables that do not have their own uh, um, system that's being prepared for the specific of uh, having a readability feature, having some way to, for the uh, accessibility feature to be implemented. Uh, and kind of what we are struggling with um, from the museum perspective, uh, not struggling with, how like the process works, I'd say, is, uh, we we collaborate with museums from all around the country and uh, we base all of our research on that particular region the museums in and we really depend on the user groups the museums bring to us to test for to basically tailor their experiences for so uh, as long as these groups are early on uh, introduced, we can always accommodate for specific groups. But I find that sometimes these groups, not uh, these groups, kind of are an afterthought for some institu institutions, and then the, the experience is already created, and then the accessibility is like an add-on, <laughs> which doesn't ever really come out great <laughs> that's like the truth of it you have to like really think about it from the beginning from the standpoint of like creating an exhibition creating an interactive um, piece that yes these are the people that we are uh, definitely tailoring the experience for and we want it accessible as, as long as we know that from the start it's always uh, accommodable like de dependent from like what we are doing if it's like super color-based experience, it's not gonna be turned into um, an experience for the blind, potentially, but it's possible for all the other types. If you are learning history, if you are learning about biology, if you just want to consume the information, read the information, it's possible. It's just the timing is really definitely the issue for us. It's like being prepared, having these resources to access, to test with, uh, to really have a user group that is, um, this is specialized for. I think that's like our biggest trouble. Uh, but, but I have to say like it's going to the bright side too because yes, we're seeing 
the, uh, the technology improve, be more accommodating, uh, kind of lift some of that stuff from being in the software that we write ourselves to like being basically handled by the uh, operating system. And basically that lifts a lot of um, value, not value, I'm saying that I'm trying to get at the point that like it's becoming less and less expensive to be able to accommodate for accessibility, which is great because then more, institu more institutions can afford it and it can be so much more widespread. So building off of what Edita was saying um, and pushing back a bit against Paul as well, I think process is, is really what's key, right? Um, I think oftentimes on the museum side, because now in, I've had the experience of being both, being a museum person working with a, a designer and being a designer working with a museum. And I think everybody thinks the other person is the expert <laughs> in accessibility. I really do. The, the museum people say, well, the designers are in charge of ADA. They know the rules. We're sure that you know, they're going to follow them, right? And the designer says, well, I'm going to find out what's important for this project based on what I'm hearing from the museum person. And so if the museum person says universal design is important, these, you know, this issue, this population comes here, we care, right? Then that's getting back to is it particular populations or is it trying to make it as accessible for everyone? But somebody on both teams, I think, <laughs> need to be the point person who are thinking about this all the way through. And I think a part of that, what's exciting about working on digital interactives, and that's sort of where I've been focusing my attention, is because pedagogy is built into interactive and digital exhibits. Like, it's built into physical exhibits too, but people don't have to ask those questions to create an information architecture in the way that they do when they're building something digital. You can push back on me against this. But this has been my... <laughs> Are you saying digital is better than physical? I'm not saying anything's better. I'm saying in terms of a place to start in thinking about the universal design of museum exhibitions, I'm finding that it's more flexible and easier to start with a place where they already have. If the pedagogy is terrible in a digital exhibit, the whole thing fails. If the pedagogy is terrible in an exhibit on the walls, then people still go through and maybe they don't spend as much time. I'm just talking about pedagogy, I'm not talking about physical access, right? But to me, I'm interested, I'm an educator, that's how I come to everything, is through universal design for learning and how do we actually think these ways. Um, so all of that being said, to answer Barbara's question about how do we apply these principles, there are really free ways of doing it if you're sensitive to it. You can create color contrasts like the one above me you can think about how you know, it's free to make one choice of colors versus another choice of colors. If you're buying furniture for an exhibition, right, here I am with physical, you can think about getting things that have, have armrests and things that don't have armrests to accommodate different needs and different body types. So there are many different things that if you're already going to be spending a certain amount of money and you're sensitive to the fact that people come with all different abilities, all different languages, different shapes and sizes, then ages, then I think that that really can go a long way. Um. So um, for those of you who do not work in museums, there are uh, two things that have come up in these conversations that you may be confused by. The first is process. Um, museum exhibitions take anywhere from one to three years to develop, and that is the process time. And I think you know, people can debate when in a process you want to have um, the different elements, but you, you, know, you need to know that there is a process. Um, the second thing is that we talked about 
as, as you may have noticed, that we're talking about teams. Um, museums, almost every museum at this point, develops exhibitions by putting together a team of usually of some permanent staff members, some um, designers and interactive designers and specialists from outside. Um, and they work together over those process years to create the exhibition. And so it's, it's, there are periods in which you can integrate design and integrate audience requests and integrate um, cost questions. Um, over those years. So there's like a continuing di discussion when you're putting together an exhibition. I actually spent most of my career at the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts, which only did short-term exhibitions. <laughs> so for us, the, um, the period of development was long, but the period in which the exhibition was up was actually very short. Um, and it was also an institution where, of course, literacy is the most precious thing in the world. So we had, you know, there was a commitment to all different kinds of literacy. So in some ways, I had uh, an outlier experience in exhibition development. Um, another thing that came up in the conversations here was um, digital and computers. Some, some of you are young. Um, some things in access, especially in terms of graphics, have become unbelievably easy <laughs> because of computers. You can change the color of, you can change the contrast color, you can change the size of text almost automatically. You still have to consider very seriously what size you want that text, which font you want, which um, all of the decisions are the same, but the process in, in making those uh, choices come to life are different. Um, brailing is now much easier because of computerization. Um, so there are things in the process and there are things um, in the team development process that are both, um, that are easier now and that are, of course everything is a great deal more challenging. One thing that came up in this conversation was audience. So um, can you speak to audience? First of all, how, how do you know what a museum's audience is? Um, how, how, how can you find out who potentially will go to an exhibition, who potentially goes to that museum? Um, has, can you talk about where evaluation fits into the process? Want to sequentially oh, you can do it any way you want. I can start I, if you want. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, you brought it up. Yeah. Um, is it working? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, it's interesting. Yes, uh, because I kind of started talking about like groups, user groups, uh, testing uh, that stuff. Uh, so I kind of can continue on. Um, so usually when we, in the process, when we get to kick off with the museum, with the staff, uh, we uh, kind of have this re research and uh, discovery period when we uh, have a lot of conversations with the museum, they share with us their statistics, they uh, kind of provide us what groups they are interested in supporting for this exhibition or for this particular interactive. Um, and that is when mostly we get the numbers, the uh, ba uh, basically like a profile of the audience, and that's from where we uh, kind of create uh, our uh, personas, our uh, and kind of also meet with some test groups, uh, and later when we. Um, 
kind of prototype and develop further, we test with these uh, test groups uh, to um, make basically the product better. Um, kind of that reminds me, so um, all the way in 2005, when the iPad first got released, uh, when I was not at Potion yet, uh, it, it was, uh, I think uh, we had a project in 2006, which, which basically was released like one year after the iPad, but it was in development maybe like two months after the iPad got launched. So basically very fresh. Nobody yet knew what the iPad could handle. Nobody yet knew like what the, what gestures are, like what do we even do, right? So uh, it was interesting because then uh, that's the time where we actually uh, made a project with uh, New York Public Library and uh, it was the Biblion app project uh, and during this project, it was basically kind of we digitalized this, this uh, basically amazing uh, collection of books. And but one of their user groups was a um, non-visual readers because that's a very actually large group at New York Public Library that we could test with. And that was an amazing experience because we could we learned through that process so much of like how to create those applications for them to use the, uh, to use uh, on the iPad and kind of how to format all of the data or the text to basically be read uh, very intuitively by the device and kind of so that it sounded very uh, correct because I don't know if you know how important it is to have a hierarchy when you are designing t to read text uh, on the device for the accessibility feature because you have to remember to like okay this is my biggest heading this is my smaller heading this is my text and that's kind of the logical order of it to be read. You cannot kind of mix things and match because then you, uh, the software thinks that you are switching between different paragraphs and different kind of text uh, content uh, and kind of makes a mess of things for the reader that is non-visual. Uh, uh, so kind of that whole experience was super learning experience for us and like without, um, New York Public Library coming forward and uh, us testing with this group, we would have not known, uh, for example, that that was like such a big impact for them. That was such an important feature. I think this gets back to um, the issue of training and what happens when you are the point person on a museum team. Then people start asking you questions as if you can speak for every population. And it's just a constant reminder that I have no idea. Let's get some people in here and ask. And I think that's really the best and only way to promote and to continue building an accessibility and universally designed project. The issue that I've learned, right, because I'm still in the middle of this process being a part of various teams, when exhibits are temporary exhibits, the timeline is often truncated from three years to less than a year. Things are being done, you know, hammers, things are being nailed into the wall like two hours before the, the opening is going to happen. So how in circumstances like that, that's what I'm really curious about, how in circumstances like this can we build in the time or can we somehow iteratively manage to bring in these user tests earlier on? Because it's a real issue, I think, in design processes, who should be at the table and at what point do you bring in which groups? I mean, museums have been going through this in any case in terms of curatorial and education staffs, right? At what point do we bring the educators in? Of course, as a pedagogue, I'm saying they should be there from the start. I understand very good reasons why others say not. But I think users, educators, curators, um, designers, it's just a really interesting conversation and every different project has a different way of doing things. What I'm interested in is what might we all do to work together to ensure that 
this issue of it being a meaningful experience for whatever population would want to come there can come. So to answer your question about audience, I think the only way is to just bring people in earlier. I agree. And I agree we know that, so why don't we do it? Well, I mean, it, it's, it, it, we agreed and understood the people who are involved early est in the process have the most impact on the end result. Whether that's a designer, whether that's a test group, whether that's a prototyping iterative group. We know the words to say, so why don't we do it as a regular process? I can tell you, as somebody who does a lot of prototyping and actually gives classes about prototyping and gives workshops about prototyping to museums, that it, it is back to the beginning of my statement, which is, if you want to make that an important part of your process, you will. And if you don't, there is somehow not time to bring in that group. There is somehow not time. You can prototype with paper and tape, literally, any exhibit that we're talking about. So the question is, if we know what to do, why doesn't it happen? And that's, to me, the interesting question. Because that's a motivation question. That's not a money question. That's not a time question, that's a willingness question. And I think that bears on all of this. I, I, I am actually very positive about the museum business and the, th this topic that we're talking about. But I'll say again, I have higher expectations for the museum business sometimes than it, I think, has for itself. Okay. Um. Well, first of all, I think that we all agree that the goal is to continuously test with as many users as we can. And we do that throughout the process as long as someone is um, making that possible because testing is a very involved uh, procedure and it requires a lot of uh, people and time, uh, which often is not available. However, I disagree. Well, I'm just telling you my experience. We're, we, we you know, are asked to provide a price for a new exhibit, and I know that if I include a budget for m my own company running a test of the, um, you know, either a formative or summative evaluation, then that will, we'll never get the job. The, the testing has to either be paid for by the institution or through a grant. I don't know, is Ellen Justy here? I think I saw her come in earlier, no? Um, actually, Ellen is a person, you might probably know her. She, yeah, so she's a, a person who's, who's, whose role is to do um, this kind of testing, and she, she did, a, does, did a lot of it, and I think there's a lot of visitor studies going on all the time, so I don't think it's, a question of irresponsibility on the part of museums. They're just, they have a lot of pressures on them and um, you know, I uh, understand their concerns. I, I, I just, I, and then I will shut up, I promise you. This is like when somebody says to me that they can't do something for me for a project because they're too busy. Everyone in this room is busy but do you still find the times to do the things that are important for you? I just don't buy it. I mean, if we want to make it happen, we will make it happen. It is not about money. It is not about time. You need money. You need time. I'm not stupid, but we too willingly cede all of these well-meaning intentions <laughs> to the ether. They just don't happen. They do happen because we, I mean, uh, I, I know that there's lots of testing of 
accessibility going on, uh, the museums that I work for. So I don't really want to, um, you know, be, belabor that point. I, I would like to return, though, to an earlier topic about technology. Is that, is that possible? Okay. Um, because I, I think that what, what Adita was talking about with the uh, innovation of tablets, I'm, I'm actually extremely optimistic. Uh, one reason is that um, I see museums, um, lots of museums nowadays are installing these uh, large touch tables, like the one uh, in, the, in the lobby here. Everyone, I'm sure, is familiar with that. It's a large um, table that has images displayed on it, and you can um, manipulate those images, you can share them with other people, you can save them, you can you know, send them to yourself for later, and it's all connected with the interactive pen. However, that experience is completely inaccessible if you can't see the images but many museums are beginning to install these tables, and one could s make the argument, well, they're, they're, that's a really irresponsible decision on their part because these, these kinds of exhibits actually uh, exacerbate um, barriers. They, they, in they in increase the, uh, the sort of barriers that disabled people have in museums. However, um, there are ways to uh, work around that and to be creative about developing solutions. And I brought along a very early sample of something that I think could begin to um, lessen the barrier presented by these large touch tables. So this is a 3D printed model of the Arts and Industries Building at the Smithsonian on the Mall in Washington. And this was, you can see that there's some black parts and some clear parts printed with a, in a process that can print in two different materials at the same time. One of them, the black, is conducts electricity and the clear is an insulator. Then we put little disks on the bottom of the model which connect internally to the black surfaces on the roof of the building. And when I place this model onto the touch table, and then I touch different parts, all these black things are now touch responsive. So when I touch this piece in the middle, it says cupola. If I touch uh, the skylight, it announces what that is. And that makes this object into something that is really universal, because now I can place it anywhere I want on the table. I can explore it. I can hear the description of it, I can feel the shape of it, and I can see it. And so we're saying that we're very close to creating highly universal environments. We're just quite not quite there yet, but the, 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 the advent of these large touch screen devices and their plummeting cost. Um, if you go to Walmart now, I, a, an Android smartphone for $25 that has everything. It has Wi-Fi, it has a screen, it has audio, it has touch. And, um, you know, the other versions of those devices that are, you know, tablets or monitors or these touch tables, they're also plummeting in cost because they're being made in such large quantities. So my thesis is that museums can begin to leverage some of these technologies, which are not quite there yet, but they're all beginning to arrive. So, for example, at the new Museum of the Natural, um, sorry, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, Washington has a very large um, thing called the, the interactive lunch counter, and that is a, a an exhibit that looks visually like the Woolworths, you know, lunch uh, counter that was so prominent in the civil rights movement and so iconic, but it's been turned into this interactive surface that everyone sits at their diner stools as if they're having lunch, but really they're consuming images that are displayed on the screen. So what we're trying to do now is to go into that museum and make models of things like the slave ship and the shackles that are exist in elsewhere in the museum but are behind glass because they're too fragile or they're too precious to be touched. 
and we can take models, these, sim these facsimiles, and place them on the interactive lunch counter, and all of a sudden, it comes to life and begins itself, and now we have a new kind of experience. So I guess that um, I feel that, uh, I, you know, I'm, I agree with Paul that, you know, we do have a, a ways to go and that we're not there, but I do think that people have, are beginning to understand the need for this. And they're seeing it as an, a need that's called for by visitors that are either not coming or are coming but being annoyed. And they are making steps. So it might not be happening as quickly as we would all like, but I believe that, um, that the awareness is there. And I think exhibits like this one and the upcoming uh, exhibit called Senses, which is opening here in April, are, are all evidence of this new um, sensitivity and awareness. And you know, I think it's a shame that you know, the momentum that we had in government up till now uh, was really pushing things in a good way, and I, I wonder whether that's going to continue. But I haven't, um, I haven't, I'm not quite as despondent. Um, so uh, I don't know. <laughs> I hope that didn't no, take I, us I, off track. I, I, I don't feel the need to be cheered up, but the, the uh, do, do we? I, uh, do we have the audience participation yes, part of the program? Um, uh, I, and I, definitely take questions from the audience. I can just add before we start that, um, because I, um, I totally see that like uh, we, yes, uh, before I said that, uh, yes, we require like user groups from the museum uh, part and uh, from whatever project we are working on, from whatever company, like to, to, sh uh, to share with us their audience for us to test with, etc. But over time, so many of what, of so, m so much of what we've learned is now like our everyday practice, especially like color contrast, that's like solid, like the first thing you were looking for now in design. Uh, the sizes of text, the sizes of type, that's exactly became more like a standard in our, on, in our case. Uh, also like reachability, especially when you're talking about like touch tables uh, and like how far the audience on the wheelchair can access that is definitely always in our mind when we design around these things. So it's not only, I'd say, about the audience, it's about our own thinking and kind of being aware, basically, of what we are designing for and kind of being continuously cautious. Really quickly, uh, uh, my name is James. For what it's worth, uh, I was at the MoMA last week. I'm actually a member, and I was told at the the door of the Tony Brucker exhibit, "Ah, you're in one of those chairs. This exhibit's not designed for you. You, you know, it's designed for a manual chair." In fact, what really happened was the guard came over and kicked us out, and then the visual uh, associate ran right after us and said, "Here's why you were kicked out." And I said, honestly, I don't think about it. I said, what do I care why I was kicked out? I was kicked out. But she said, no, no, no. In the future, at some point, you'll be welcome. How do you handle that quirk of exhibits? It's meant for one chair, but not your chair. OK. Um, you know, every time I, I feel that museums have progressed, we do one of these workshops and we get a complaint, a perfectly valid complaint about a museum. Um, and I can't speak for MoMA, of course. Um, I like to think that an institution would train its guards to facilitate every visitor that's sort of the basic role of a museum is to train its staff to facilitate the visitor. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just at a loss, like what, what was the issue? Is it because your, your wheelchair is 
the motor wheelchairs are bigger than the uh, standard size, right? So really, really quickly, um, the, the exhibit had loose material on the ground as part of it. It was a performance and interactive, and they believed that an electric chair would drag that through the museum, but a portable, but a manual would not. Did you, um, did you contact MoMA and ask I'll about let, this? I'll let, I'll let. Uh, we have someone from MoMA here. Okay. <laughs> I'm here from MoMA. My name is Francesca. And I, hi, Francesca. I, uh, yes, hi. <laughs> um, so here is an example of when a very big institution um, tries its best and it fails. And, um, you know, I will say for me, I'm very sorry that you had to experience something like that. Um, we try very hard to make sure that something like that doesn't happen because I understand that if something like that happens, it changes your view of that institution perhaps for life. And that's um, you know, that, that's very hurtful. So, um, I, what you've described is exactly right. There is sugar cane in the artist's exhibition. And we understood that it may, we were afraid that wheelchairs would get stuck. So what we ended up doing was working with the mayor's office for people with disabilities and borrowing a beach wheelchair as one option. Another option was um, to have educators who have been trained to describe what is in the exhibition. So you would go into sort of the entryway and then go as far as you could, but then from there you would um, get a description of, um, of what, what you know, you would be experiencing if you were able to go all the way. So we did work with the curators, we've worked with vi visitor engagement, um, with security, but again, it's an institution of hundreds of people, and that's not a good excuse, but that's what I believe ended up happening in your situation. Um, so I'm, I'm truly sorry about that, and I do hope that other people will come and be able to experience the Tanya Bruguera um, exhibition because it is quite extraordinary, and I'm happy to talk to you more about this after. But I, I would like to further the question, and if you want to say anything else about it, but the, the question um, I think is excellent, which is about artist's intent, right? So here we have a situation where an artist has kind of created something that limits what, um, what can be experienced. It is not universally designed. So how do we solve that problem, right? And we've tried sort of, you know, from, from the behind the scenes again with the curators. I mean, we've had, we've had examples of this all the time, right? We have a Klaus Oldenburg exhibition. He did a mouse museum that was not physically accessible. So instead, we worked with um, the team at MoMA to film what was inside the museum um, so that on the screens outside, there would be an understanding of what was um, on display inside. So I guess I would just throw it out to the panel if you all have examples of, um, of you know, good examples of where you've been able to solve this, this problem of keeping with the artist's in, intent, um, but also making their work accessible. Uh, and I'd just give a, just give a shout out to Francesca, because I brought graduate students from Bank Street there to learn about all the wonderful things that MoMA does in terms of accessibility. So, uh, you know, the, the, you get 99 things right, and of course the one thing that you don't is the thing that we want to improve, which still needs to be improved. I, I, think, I think a lot of this has to do with the, the way someone feels 
when they come to your museum and when they leave your museum. I, I, and I just always make the analogy to a good restaurant experience. You know, if you've never been to a restaurant, but you go there for the first time, there are places that you go that you instantly feel like you are welcomed. You feel like you are in the right place. And as you go along, you may not even be able to articulate why you feel so good about this particular place, but you do. And all those little things, I mean, what you just gave as the example with the Mouse Museum, I think that is the way that even my curmudgeonly soul would, would, would say, this is, this, is a great, this is a great way to do this. I mean, you, you could say, well, Van Gogh and Picasso aren't accessible either, so we'll just write them off. Of course, you look at ways to describe that, to do audio description, to look at other ways of providing people access. And I think it really is how you make people feel. There's never this perfect, even though we talk about universal design, there is no like silver bullet that's perfectly universal, universal in every possible way. But people know how they feel after they've come to your place. I, 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 you know, obviously this gentleman didn't feel that good about that interaction. Um, but I think uh, having someone like Francesca and her team at MoMA, I, I honestly think she'll take that to heart and take that back <laughs> to people. give it one other little piece of context from the museum world, historic house museums, I think, often say, we've got a Picasso, we've got a Monet, we don't have to worry about it, right? But in our case, that piece of art is a structure, and it doesn't mean that historic house museums are able to just say, oh, you know, we're not accessible. Um, but I also think it, it's an interesting point because this this whole concept of universal design and equity and equality and, I mean, we're all different. And so this, this idea, and, and I do think this whole, also this whole conversation about um, participation of disabled people in the process, but also getting disabled people to be aware, aware of what's, what's out there and what's, um, so marketing and how you, um, how you open up your museums to a new community is has to be looked at just like museums and theaters and any other cultural organizations looks at how they increase their audiences in general. People are not just going to come just without their the proper marketing. And until I think any any arts venue starts looking at disabled people as um, a, a constituency that they're interested in including. Um, we're going to have these issues where it's we, we look at accessibility from the point of view of the programs, but we kind of stop with how we then let that information out to the communities. I mean, I think that there are places that I can go to, there are places that I can't go to. I think from, from my perspective, if I'm informed and respected and told things, I don't, I don't necessarily, I expect to be told if I have to go through the back door, and that that's what you think of accessibility. What really pisses me is off is when you say your venue is accessible, and then I have to go through the back door without that, because it's not my that then it's not my decision. If it's my decision and I'm willing to go through the back door, and I know that in advance, that changes my perspective too. I might not like it, but at least I've been informed, and at least I I recognize that you've thought about it, and I. I know, I, I'm from New York, and I know there are lots of places that are inaccessible, but I just want to be informed. And so we have to start taking the, the programs and bringing those out to the communities and letting them know that this is, we want you to come and that you're, you're important to us to come. Not that we've done all this work and we've made it accessible and now we're done and we expect you to come just because we've done all this work, they, we have to start doing that next step. And I think that's where there's also a big disconnect with um, getting the words out. Because then what happens is 
you spend all this time and energy and money on whatever accessibility or universal design work that you've done, and then nobody shows up, and then it's, oh, look at those disabled people. We did all this work, and we did all this, spent all this money, and nobody's coming. So what did we do it for? So we have to start being much more inclusive about the communities that we want in, um, and, and looking at that as well. I think just to add to that, too, I think there's, in terms of cultural and institutional um, education, what is accessibility? If we say it's accessible, you smack a wheelchair sign on it, right? The idea that there's a range of universal symbols is something that I can't tell you how many people have been shocked to learn about, right? And to be able to specify to which populations is this accessible and in what ways, like you're saying. Um, for those of you who are new to MAC events, um, I do want to point out that our website does have a cultural calendar of um, events in New York area. And so if you want to know, you know what day there will be a, a ASL tour of a museum, you can use the calendar for that. So yeah. this, this question may not be precise enough, but I'm looking for reflection um, from the panel on, it's one thing if we have developed something from the beginning with that sense of universal design and accessibility and I'm wondering about when you're sort of backing your way into that. So you have existing services, you have existing access points um, and you're, you're sort of, that, that has not been considered and you're, you're kind of working your way into that with existing programs, with existing um, systems, particularly um, in the digital realm. Um, and relatedly, how sort of those sacred ideas of what our institutions provide, um, sort of pushing back on some of that, which if, if what we're used to is not universally accessible, um, how we sort of open, expand that idea culturally within our sort of staff, and to, if that made sense. Yeah, I think um, there is a really good example. We did this one project with the Canadian Museum of Human Rights, um, where we did the exhibition on uh, rights in courts. Um, and their museum is phenomenal with accessibility, I have to say. The, uh, the exhibition itself that we worked on has, um, uh, how it looks like is basically there is this uh, big round tab table in the center. Uh, there are uh, basically single individual stations where people vote on cases and overhead there are uh, videos, uh, the case video study. So that has audio, French and English um, written text, and also uh, interpreters uh, talking, uh, basically signing both in English and in French uh, the cases, basically. And so over time, and we knew that basically from the beginning, so we could uh, basically designed for, yes, there's gonna be, uh, here's our room for our interpreter on the screen, here's the room for our both French and English text, here is our timed experience, here's where's our progressive experience. We have, on each of the stations, we have accessible uh, pad, uh, also in our an earphone plugin, so, basically, if you are only auditory, you can still uh, participate, if you're only visual, you can totally participate. Like there is, uh, if you're on a wheelchair, everything is wheelchair accessible. There are seats if you have to sit down if you have some kind of injury. So I think here, basically in the United States, we just have to kind of spread the awareness more because there's places that basically take it to heart and basically design for all from the beginning, and there are places that don't really take them in, into as much of a consideration. Uh, but to your point about like backing, going back, and uh, trying to make some of these things accessible, um, it is not easy, because sometimes things have to be rewritten, right? Sometimes things have to be assigned different hierarchy, sometimes things, or like if th there's no operating system that even reads the information back to you, 
that thing has to be written, it has to be in different languages again, it has to be enabled, etc. It's not that easy, but it also, it's not the end of the world. You can always backtrack a little bit and see how that much carries you forward and then in the future just p plan from the beginning because like there is some things you cannot just um, drastically change when you're coming back. Um, yes. I just, um, two things. One is um, probably the, the strongest mediating factor in museums are human staff on the floor. Um, they can cover a multitude of design sins and also help mediate situations that might be uncomfortable or not easily understood. So uh, <laughs> there's, there's this, so in a way it's easy but it's not cheap because museums seem unwilling to put staff people on the floor because that costs money. But in a situation like that, that's, that's one thing I would say. Also this gives me an opportunity to just tell my favorite digital joke, that, which is that Mothers are the original 3D printers. <laughs> I want to address something that I haven't heard that I think might help in dealing with the powers that be in terms of finance and planning. If you say that visual is good and the audio is good. Well, the visual plus audio is good for everyone. In other words, things that make an exhibit accessible is also good for people who don't need special accessibility but can enhance their experience. You don't want them to just be at the museum to say, okay, I had a good time today. You want to take something away. And by multiplying the amount of multisensory uh, activity that goes on in an exhibit, you've done that much more in uh, making your exhibit meaningful. And therefore, that's the selling point on why you have to have all of these things, because it's good for everybody. Um, as an educator, I discovered with my limited vision that if I blew up the New York Times 130% so I could see it sitting there on a the table of a student or groups of students, which I usually work with, um, those kids who said they couldn't read the New York Times because it was too hard, well, when you blew it up 130%, guess what? They could read the New York Times. I just want to you know, share one little story connected to that because I agree with you a thousand percent. And it's one of, I had an experience where I learned how sometimes things like contrast or font size work, design, you know, trends are working with accessible and universal design trends. But I came up against a designer who said, I said, well, can we have an icon and say the words? Because it was just the words. And she said, but design principles say, why would you have all this extraneous information, right? We want just one. And I was like, well, shoot, your principle is an exact con conflict with my principle. So where do we go from there? And so just to give you a sense of some of those conversations that happen behind the scenes, you know, we needed to try to figure it out. And I lost eventually, but that, that's one thing that happened. So I just want to go on more with this, the visual and the audio. I don't hear very well, and I've been given all this stuff. I can't see half of you because the lighting isn't good, and I don't know if it affects other people, but I like to be able to read lips. And because of the backlighting, this, I, you, when you said people are shaking their heads, I didn't know you were speaking. I couldn't see you well enough. My vision is not that good. So. Just something to think about. Uh, and how could I have expressed that earlier? I didn't want to interrupt the program. So a lot of us don't always feel confident to be able to stop people and tell them we're having problems. And it probably would have affected everybody if they could see you better. A few of you are in the light, but that's not well thought out. I should 
just uh, point out, before we hear from Ruth and this woman over here also, um, I can't look into light. I can't look into bright light. And when we had our last workshop, which was um, in conjunction with some theater organizations at the um, Alliance of Resident Theaters, it was in a theater and therefore there was theater lighting. And when I was reporting out on discussions, I had to turn away from the audience so that I wasn't staring into the lights. Um, so I'm very sorry that that meant that you couldn't read my lips. Um, but there are frequently conflicts in the cures for um, access problems also. Yeah. Honestly, it might have been a net plus that you couldn't see me that well. <laughs> we can see you. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Um, my name is Ruth and I'm profoundly hard of hearing. I'm on the MAC steering committee and I'm on the board of New York City HLAA. I just want to give a shout out for Francesca because I was a member of the advisory committee the Disability Advisory Committee that she put together 30 plus years ago. And what I would like, and I worked with Sarah at the Tenement Museum and I'm still going down there to help out. What I would like to suggest to all the cultural and museum groups is that they put together a standing committee of people with various disabilities who can come in and help you. I don't remember how often we met, Francesca, uh, but we met quite often and it, we were giving her feedback. It was not, it was people with all disabilities and it was really a very effective way of getting feedback on what the museum needed to do. Um, Pamela, I just want to follow up on what um, she said. And you have every right not to have light shining in your eyes, but um, if I think if any one of us with hearing loss had been here, we would have simply suggested that you move the table this way so that we don't have all those bright windows behind you, because that's what really, and that's a very, very simple correction you just need to have the person who un understands the problem there in the design stage, I think. This is a fantastic exhibit, and this is a really interesting panel discussion. Uh, um, it's such a simple uh, thing that you just don't think about unless you're the person experiencing it. And uh, forgive us, because this is, w this is a new learning curve for us. And what I learned in our uh, program on Friday morning <laughs> about designing accessible presentations and symposiums was that we should have stopped first and done a check-in. And right after I gave my remarks, I realized that I did not do that. So there's always next time. There's always next time. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Uli Kotenko, and I'm legally blind. And I do love to go to museums. It's one of my greatest hobbies. I'm fortunate enough to travel the world a lot and I visit museums on my own um, with my visual impairment. I write about that in a blog, so if you want first-hand uh, experiences, just read my blog. I write about how I access museums, how I am able to experience the art there, and um, I think it's interesting for everyone. I try to get um, the information out to my fellow visually impaired uh, colleagues. And, um, but coming back to the universal design, what I find in most of the museums, not all of them, but most of them, and which is really bothering me most in all those great museums is the labels. So you're coming to your design and font size and everything. Every museum seems to have their own um, guidelines to do the labels. They're mostly hard to find 
and very hard to read. And this is a very easy, very uh, cheap uh, first step for a really good exhibition for visually impaired people. And not only visually impaired, but all the people who get older and, you know, get their visual <laughs> impairment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everyone wants to read what's on the label. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you're welcome to contact me if you want to what's, read my blog. What's your blog? My, uh, my blog is called Zoom in Museums. Uh, um, uh, C like zebra. O O M. Zoom in. Zoom like uh, to zoom in and out. <laughs> zoom in museums. <laughs> no, zoom in museums. And dot com. It's yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. I thank you to the Cooper Hewitt for this wonderful, dis and to everybody, to this wonderful uh, discussion. I just wanted to underscore on the comment that was made about um, um, honest advertising and inclusive advertising of a museum exhibit. This is a, um, uh, a challenge of our time, finding the language to address a public that has different degrees of sensitivities and understanding as we're all learning during this time. Uh, I just wanted to mention that the same challenge exists for, for instance, um, blind users who are shopping online. And there's a beautiful jacket in the exhibit um, downstairs, Access Plus Ability, that has a variety of ways of putting it on. Uh, side Velcro openings, uh, widened zipper, and so on. And if someone were looking for that online, um, we need to develop descriptions that include any, um, anything in that object that satisfies a need that uh, um, has often been not considered uh, until now. So developing language is, is uh, a challenge that is faced in many areas, and just wanted to share that. We have a question. Just to quickly, uh, just to quickly, got to that point because that's super important for web. When uh, just a quick tip from Potion, uh, when you have a hover state with text description, to have that text description describe uh, as much as you can of the images or of the buttons really helps a lot for the visually impaired for that, uh, exactly for this problem to describe the object. Yeah. Hey, we got somebody in the cheap seat. Oh. <laughs> Hello. We talked a lot about process in museum exhibitions, but I didn't hear any of the panelists say anything about curators. And I was wondering um, if you had any opinions about what their responsibility, um, involvement, um, any of that is in developing um, accessible exhibitions. Wow, I have tons of opinions about <laughs> curators. I, I'm, I'm a curator, um, although as you probably noticed, I am someone who is concerned with access. Um, the artifacts that we exhibit, I mean, the, the exhibition downstairs is an exhibition about access, and all of the artifacts are about access. Um, this is not true of many exhibitions. And many of the artifacts that I have exhibited have been almost completely inaccessible um, to those who cannot read them. This can be literally read as in um, understand the language or sometimes the written out music or it can be read as in visually understand. Um, we try to use as many 
different modalities as possible, which is easy for me because I work in the performing arts as a subject matter. Um, the artifacts which tend to be curator's original focus um, create their own problems, present their own problems, just as historic buildings present their own problems. Um, this institution, of course, is one that is in, uh, that considers its building an, an artifact um, and has done memorable work to interpret that artifact. Um, it is also one that frequently has collected and exhibits materials, artifacts, um, which are meant to be used. If you get downstairs, you can see the most amazing exhibition of what are basically tea sets. They are meant to be picked up. They are meant to be used. And most people who go to the exhibition will have a visual, possibly auditory, and tactile memory of what it means to use that particular object. Not obviously the silver one, but what it means to use a tea kettle, what it means to use a cup and saucer. However, there are people in the audience who do not have that tactile memory or whose tactile memory of a teacup is breaking a teacup or spilling tea out of a teapot. Um, and that's the kind of challenge that access causes for curators, um, as, as well as the challenges that access can cause for design and interpretation. Not an excuse, just... Um, letting you know that curators do feel a challenge here. I have a suggestion for a future Mac workshop, a hands-on workshop, making the inaccessible accessible. You, 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 the question you asked earlier about how you back into things or historic houses, there are tons of situations where we don't want people to physically access these unique cultural artifacts, but you still want them to understand them if they've never had the experience with those things before. I think that would be an awesome workshop. Hi. Um, so I know that when we're talking about making our cultural institutions more accessible, we always are asking who's not in the room. And so from a cursory glance around this room, I notice a preponderance of white people. And I'm wondering what, where the conversation is um, talking about intersecting access for ability with access for people of other identities. Somebody was saying before, how do we let people know that things are happening and they are welcome, really welcome? Uh, I, I'm not saying anything derogatory about the intent of this workshop, but your point is well taken. But also I could say the same thing when I teach classes at FIT or Bank Street or go to AAM most of the time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Linda Kaplan from American History Workshop. And I want to say first, Paul, I think that's a great idea about doing a hands-on um, workshop about how we can back into these things. Well, no, that's true. But, but to the question before you was about curators. And uh, I work with a lot of, uh, primarily in history museums, and I think it is incumbent upon the curator to bring the toolbox of accessibility that we have. Because if the curator doesn't do it, 
you know, the exhibit designer doesn't necessarily have an invested interest in doing it. So, and the education department that often has the people who work on accessibility, as was mentioned earlier, are not often brought to the table until way after the exhibit is designed. So I think curators play a, a big role in making sure that accessibility in many different ways is on the table. I just want to second what Linda said. Maybe, I don't know if we're, we're coming from the, muse of the history museum world, if it's different in other, in other areas, I'd be curious to know. But I think um, that was kind of the point I was trying to get at um, in terms of the curators thinking that the designers are going to bring that. But the designers, if they don't hear that this is a priority, and, and what specifically this, meaning universal design is, in what way that is integral to the concept of the exhibit, it ain't gonna happen. Um, it happens with, um, I mean, architects ever since the, uh, on, ever since uh, the ADA, I remember when I was an architect and they introduced the ADA, and we were all pulling our hair out and saying, how in the world are we ever going to get our minds around this? You know, we have to make toilet stalls how many inches wide, and there has to be turning radiuses. We were like, couldn't believe it. It was like, this is just government overreach on a massive, intrusive scale. We must, you know, resist. And now, you know, 20 years later, it's just second nature, and of course we do these things. We don't think twice about it. And um, we also, um, you know, put up signs that have Braille room numbers uh, and do many other things that are stipulated under that um, rule. And I think, you know, uh, these changes don't happen immediately, but they do happen uh, over time. And I do feel that, you know, curators are becoming more um, aware of the need to ensure um, equity in you know who can who can use these exhibits so um, yeah again I, I just I see change happening incrementally and I do think that um, it's not an impossible problem and and it is being uh, addressed in a slow way it's frustratingly slow however Geologically slow. I'm not the only curator in the world who cares about access. Even if I am a curator with an education degree from Bank Street, um, it's it's it is um, one of the reasons that the museum field uses team approach to exhibition development is so that the, the training and the focus of the various staff members can be brought together from the, as early as possible in the project's lifetime. And to, uh, also to add to that, it's like, I mean, me, because I'm representing Potion right now, it's like, we work with so many different clients and only maybe half of them are museums. So it's like very hard for us to understand the needs of museums or other clients because of course the clients that are more corporate, they don't have, they don't necessarily have to follow a ADA and it's only like our, like just being cautious saying like, oh maybe how about we put the reach a bit lower so someone on the wheelchair can access this screen, right? But for, so, but they don't have, uh, for example, a, a team of um, basically accessibly challenged users to like help us with determining like what could be a challenge here. So like us coming from this kind of perspective where we focus on creating these interactive experiences, we really need to have some kind of guidance. Um, so kind of that's from museum side is always very important. Um. It doesn't seem like a curator has a job to do, the designer has a job to do. Is there such a thing as a disabilities coordinator on the staff of most museums? And could that person be in the early planning for 
new exhibits? Uh, there are disability coordinators, um, various job titles in many museums in New York. Um, the Smithsonian Institution has one per museum, um, as well as one, I think, just with the design team. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. Um, Mac is almost entirely made up of people who are professionally committed to access. And the, um, the members of the steering committee, many of whom are here today, many of whom met you at the door, um, are frequently that person in the museum. It's a great field if anyone is looking for a museum specialty. Um, it will, uh, you'll get to meet all these people and work with all of these different institutions and figure out how access needs to be integrated into every museum project. It's interesting that you said the curator has their job and the designer has their job and stuff. I, I'm, I'm working uh, on an installation and an opening of a museum right now and the graphics person was installing this graphic of a big Leonardo da Vinci set of like copies of his notebook and the graphics person said, oh, I think they printed this wrong. It's all written backwards. <laughs> which, was a great, uh, which was a great learning uh, opportunity right there because Leonardo da Vinci wrote in mirror writing to but, but the thing is, my point is, the graphics person wasn't just there to put this graphic on the wall. He was actually paying attention and wanted to like say, wait, 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 before we put this thing on the wall, is this right? And so, it, totally, we all have our jobs, but maybe there's like bigger shared understanding of where our jobs fit into this bigger picture. I mean, I just love that the, the, the guy was like, Oh no, there's a problem. It's, it's printed backwards. And it's like, oh, okay, well, here's a. But, like, I'm glad he said that. I'm super glad he said that. He was paying attention to not just slapping the thing on the wall. Thank you all for coming. And um, please, you know, sign up for the Mac mailing list as well as the Cooper Hewitt mailing list. If you have a chance, please do look at the uh, student projects that are in this gallery. They are really fascinating and I hope very much that some of them will be prototyped and on the market soon. Um, the museum is open for another hour. Yes, and please take advantage. Yes. If you have not seen our exhibitions, uh, please, please do. Please do go ahead. And thank you. And uh, Mac would like to thank the Cooper Hewitt so much for this uh, great collaboration. Thank you. This was a wonderful opportunity. Thank you.